Good afternoon and welcome to our third webinar, Nuts and Bolts of People First Main Streets. My name is Jackson Chabot and today I'm going to be with you as one of your toolkit translators. Before we begin, I'd like to offer a few thanks. First, to all of you as our audience members for your interest in this toolkit and specifically in these webinars. Second, we'd also collectively like to offer our deep appreciation to the ANT and Robert M. Bath Foundation whose generous support has made today and this toolkit possible. As I mentioned, my name is Jackson Chabot and I'm here today with Project for Public Spaces. As we have with the past few webinars, we're again offering AIA and AICP credit. For the AIA credit, fill out your name and member number in the PDF that should be in the chat box to the right of your screen, listed as Webinar 3 Final. And if you can't find it there, we're going to send it out after the webinar. For the AICP credits, you can self-report those. Before we begin, we want to take a moment to reflect on what some of the audience members have sent us following the last webinar. And so in that PDF, we asked, what streetscape asset is making a positive impact on your main street? And as you see with the six impact areas to the right, people responded accordingly. Connected pedestrian routes, street trees, historic arch signs, wide sidewalks, seasonal planters, and numerous murals. A wide range of things that connect the dots between impact areas and specific nuts and bolts elements that we're going to talk about today. Here from Brigham City, Utah, we have an example on the left of street trees. And then again on the right, you'll see the historic arch sign. Included in this webinar response, several participants from Utah, Virginia, Idaho, and Missouri told us these responses. We feel like these really connected the dots to what some audience members responded after the first webinar and saying and commenting on things they wanted to hear about from us today which we'll dive into a bit later on. Before we get started, I wanna cover a few housekeeping notes. First, this is a four part series that's run every Tuesday for the past two Tuesdays today, and then we'll have our concluding one next Tuesday on November 19th. We've designed this series as a masterclass where each webinar will build upon each other and talk to each other. We'd like you to watch them in order, but we recognize that if you're interested in a specific topic, you can also just watch those individually. While we'd love to have you on as a live audience member, we've also recorded these and they're available via YouTube or through your GoToWebinar registration link. You can find the YouTube channel link easily at www.mainstreet.org backslash navigating Main Street. Again, that's www.mainstreet.org backslash navigating Main Street. And so at the end of the day, we're gonna have a question and answer. And if you'd like to submit a question, please use the chat box off to the right, as well as if you'd like to submit a comment. Our final note is we have a large audience today. And so all of you have, except for the speakers, been muted, but please do use the chat box because we'd love to hear from you. And as such, we've included several interactive elements today to do that. As a reminder, this product and a set of products has been jointly made by Project for Public Spaces and the National Main Street Center. And as we were doing this project collectively, we realized the alignment of our approaches, of which you'll see the PPS, the Project for Public Spaces approach on the left side of your screen, and the Main Street America approach on the right side, and where the synergies are between the two. So for today's agenda, we're really excited to bring you a few specific elements and a few new elements that we haven't done before. The first, my colleague Shaylee will tell you about the toolkit story. Then we're gonna launch into some specific nuts and bolts of people first streets, which are really the streetscape elements that we're gonna tell you a bit more about later on. And then we're really excited to have some stories from the field from Kalispell, Montana, San Diego, California, and Hoboken, New Jersey, with representatives with us today from each. And then we're gonna connect it back and how we talk to each other and look forward just a little bit and wrap up with a Q&A so that you're able to ask specific questions to 
Catherine, Christopher, and Ryan relative to their geographic areas. And now my colleague Shaylee Zog will take it from here. Thank you, Jackson. Hello to everyone who's joining us today. I'm Shaylee. I'm from Project for Public Spaces, and I'm here again to situate today's webinar within the Bull Toolkit story. By now you've been following along with the webinar. You've probably seen this streetscape rendering a couple times, and by now I'm hoping you've also started reminding yourself of our guiding philosophy for this toolkit, which is streets as places. Streets as places is a concept recognizing that streets are more than just spaces for cars, but are also places where life unfolds. And these places encompass more than just the roadway, they encompass all that might be featured in the streetscape image and more. From the building facades to painted crosswalks, from the street food vendor to the community pride one might feel on Main Street, Streets as Places is a philosophy that recognizes that we need both places to move through and places to feel safe and comfortable enough to stay on. Streets as Places is that mindset that helped us develop the toolkit chapters in this webinar series. So in the first webinar, we featured this philosophy and introduced how the toolkit can be used to navigate complex street conversations, planning, and the collaborative processes we need. In last week's webinar, this, um, this webinar and our final webinar are all meant to address the questions of why, what, and how. Last week, we talked about why transportation matters for Main Streets and surrounding community streets. And we answered that question by talking about six impact areas of equity, safety, health, economic vitality, environmental sustainability, and community. Today, we will build on that discussion by featuring the second chapter of the toolkit and, um, and talk about some of the nuts and bolts of planning, design, managing, and programming streets that put people first and provide the opportunity to address those six key impact areas. This chapter of the webinar series and toolkit is meant to help us all understand the complex nature of elements that contribute to Great Main Street. And it can also be a helpful tool to allow all leaders to be equipped with a similar transportation and street language so that everyone might know what we mean by words and phrases like wayfinding or traffic calming. And I'll let Lindsay uh, from Main Street America tell us a little bit more about this chapter. But before I do, I wanted to take a moment for us to do an interactive activity. Um, if you've been with us, you've seen sort of our way of doing these activities. And so I'm gonna switch to Mentimeter. <clears throat> Go to www.menti.com and you'll use this code 803778. Um, and we're gonna be asking you this question of what are some of the um, how you guys would maybe rate your community streetscape elements and strategies. These are just a sampling of some ideas, elements, and strategies we talk about within Chapter 2 of the Toolkit. So we know this doesn't cover everything you might have in your community. Uh, but once you've opened menti.com and typed in that code, you will get this list of eight different elements that you can rate on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is lacking and 10 means your community is doing really awesome at this strategy. So please let us know how you do your streetscape elements and strategies. You'll notice that the numbers keep switching and that's just kind of showing the average of people's answers. And then the, the waves and peaks are showing how many, the frequency of times people have also said the same thing as you. Um, we thought this could be a fun way for you to see how you match up with some of your peers on this webinar series and perhaps know that you are not alone. Um, and it can help us know what future tools and resources might be helpful to you all and that we could maybe provide in the future. If you happen to not be able to open this link right now, please feel free to add some comments in the question box. Or you can also come back to this uh, menti.com page um, and using this code which it will be available for a few days after this webinar. Uh, so thank you all for participating. Continue, feel free to continue adding this, and it's, um, but I'm gonna now transition us back so that Lindsay can tell you about that chapter in a little bit more detail. One moment. Okay. 
Take it away, Lindsay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Shaylee and Jackson. Uh, hi, everybody. You probably recognize my voice. Good to be here again. Thanks for being back for week three. So just a quick, quick uh, overview of the Chapter 2 framing that is going to our women are here today, too. In Chapter 2 of our handbook, we, um, we're looking at the nuts and bolts for people first trade. So basically looking at the different elements that um, Looking at the what's, right? Looking at the different elements that create people for streets, uh, looking at the ways and strategies to achieve them. One thing that we should mention, which we have before, but just to reiterate, that chapter two and chapter three of the handbook really go hand in hand. So even though we have this as chapter two, it isn't meant to happen before chapter three, they're really meant to happen in concert. So keep that in mind, especially for this webinar and next week's webinar. Um, but as you're looking at this slide here, just to show you how this is organized, to help you find the kinds of uh, resources and tools that you're looking for for these specific topics, you can see how these are organized. So we broke it down into four overarching themes, uh, street scheme design and pedestrian networks, managing traffic, so it's multimodal traffic, including bicycles and cars, not just cars. Smart parking and funding is, is, is its own kind of bucket there. Under the first three, we dove into elements of physical planning and design, so things around infrastructure and amenities. And we also mentioned programming because it cannot be overstated how important programming is in terms of having people first streets. So under each of those three, we kind of delve into both of those things. And then, we also, kind of as an overarching lens for the entire chapter, look into policies, tools, resources, best practices that come from uh, around the country and uh, from organizations around the country as well, looking into how to achieve these people first streets. So think of that as the overarching lens. So different kinds of policies that you might be interested in, a lot of them are in there. So what we want to spend the bulk of today on is hearing from people who are doing really, really incredible work around creating people first streets. So on this slide, I'm showing the four case studies we highlight in the toolkit, but we're lucky today to have an additional representative from Hoboken, New Jersey, to talk about his experience. But um, you will hear from someone from Kalispell and San Diego as well. Before we get to them, I just want to give you a brief, uh, brief look at the other two case studies highlighted. So the first one, we have Hendersonville, North Carolina, is a rural main street in, in the North Carolina mountains. Uh, we often hear about in main streets that, you know, a lot of main streets are on state highways, which obviously creates some safety issues and many issues uh, that we examined within that um, week two webinar in chapter one, looking at chapter one. So in Hendersonville, because of these safety concerns, they instituted a serpentine design in 1978, which is the central photo you see there, to set on traffic to create easier, uh, easier movement through the district so that people would stop and park and go shopping. Um, and this was a, a it wasn't popular community wide, but it was very popular with the business owners. And over time, it became more popular with people in the community as well because of the safety improvements and that sort of thing. Um, it was so popular that in 2006, when the city wanted to do an overhaul of the serpentine design to freshen it up, the, uh, they, expanded, they expanded it one more block and brought in other kinds of streetscape elements, some public seating, mobile seating, um, some canopy spaces, so that it's not just about the movement of the vehicles, it was a lot about the pedestrian experience too. So for those of you who are interested in looking at um, examples of main streets on highways and how they've mitigated some of those effects, this is one really good example. Uh, just quickly about New York. So Park Smart is a program in New York, which uh, up until about 2000 had some of the lowest parking costs, parking meter costs in the country, like per capita and based on how many people live there. Um, so in about 2001, they started toying with different kinds of parking restrictions to see what, what they could do. Uh, and in 2008, ParkSmart was instituted as an opt-in program rather than a citywide enforced program so that they wanted to um, 
get more public participation, get more community engagement around it. And essentially what it does is restricts parking to a maximum of one paid hour. And they started in one community in 2008 and it's expanded across the city based on which communities have wanted to partake in the program. And what they've found in the 11 years since it started is that parking availability has increased, traffic congestion has decreased just as they hoped, and this congestion decrease has really created the potential for multimodal infrastructure. So people feel a little bit safer, they don't have to drive around double parked cars or you know, constantly, um, cars that are constantly driving around looking for spots, it's a little bit safer for different modes of transportation. It's also generated a lot of revenue, uh, both at meters and through fines, which you know is good and bad, of course, but an interesting, um, interesting element of the program. So, with that, um, these are your main event speakers today. Uh, we have, as we mentioned before, representatives from Kalispell. Catherine King is the assistant director of community and economic development in Kalispell. Uh, Chris DeMoville is the Assistant Director of Uptown Parking District in San Diego, and Ryan Sharp is the Director of Transportation and Planning in Hoboken, New Jersey. So they have some really cool programs they've been working on that they're going to talk to you about. So I am going to now hand it over to Catherine to tell you all about a really, really amazing program they're working on in Kalispell. Hello. This <laughs> I want, I want to first say, this is Catherine, um, I first want to say thank you to Lindsay and the National Main Street Center for including Kalispell in today's webinar, along with these other great case studies from across the country. Um, as Lindsay said, I am Catherine King, and I've been working with the city on what became eventually the core and rail redevelopment project um, for nearly 10 years. We, Kalispell, is, uh, we're located uh, in the northwest corner of Montana near Glacier National Park. Kalispell is a city of 25,000 people located in a county of 100,000, though geographically the county is larger than the state of Connecticut, so we're still pretty rural. Um, we see about 3 million out-of-area visitors each year, and we have US Highway 93, which we call it Main Street, uh, running north-south through the town, and it intersects with US Highway 2 going east-west at the center of town. And so. Um, today, what I want to do is just describe some of the background and our project first, and then speak to lessons learned, and, and I'll pass the baton on. So let me move us. There we go. Um, so again, to, to the point of background, in 2009, 10, 11, Kalispell was one of the hardest hit Montana communities um, by the Great Recession. And at that same time, in city government, we were learning the word brownfields. And we had success winning three grants in three years, um, assessment, area-wide planning, and environmental cleanup uh, revolving loan fund. And the US EPA brownfields area-wide planning pilot grant was really foundational to the core and rail project. Kalispell took this opportunity to look closely at the center of our city, which was dominated by 100-year-old railroad tracks now serving only two businesses, and surrounded by asphalt or gravel lots, and total some 44 acres of vacant and underdeveloped properties in the center of town. Some people might call it a blighted area. Um, in any case, the area hadn't seen significant investments since the last time um, the community worked to get the tracks out of town, which was back in 1985. Um, at that time, Council managed to move the tracks half a block north, and we built a 1980s mall, which you see basically in the center of your screen in that green area. There's the mall, here's Highway 93, and here's Highway 2, just to give you a little reference. Um, if I come back to the year 2010, uh, we were realizing that if we continued to do nothing, we could expect more of the same, more disinvestment. So we reached out to business and property owners in this railroad corridor. Uh, this is 365 acres, some 1,100 parcels, about 450 property owners. Over the course of 18 months, we held multiple community open house events, mailed quarterly neighborhood newsletters, and presented to every local group you know you know them, the Rotary, Elks, Eagles, Lions, and so on, anyone who would have us. And then we also met with 139 of these core area property owners individually, and their land holdings represented some 60% of the land in the core area. We asked their perspective on what was going well and what needed to change, and then we listened. 
99% of people said it was time for the tracks to go and they wanted a greener, I mean like literally greener, more trees and grass, um, more walkable community. The difference between the 1980s effort and our 2010, 11, 12 effort was that we not only understood how critical it is to keep rail access and our rail businesses running, we worked out partnerships and a plan this time. And the city developed a partnership with the County Economic Development Authority to create a new home for the tracks and the businesses that use them. This partnership brought access to US EDA grant funds, which paired importantly with Kalispell's US EPA brownfield dollars for assessments. So now I'll move us forward to our project map. So as I said, we created a plan and crafted a community vision. We partnered with the Railroad Economic Development Authority at the county level and the last two rail serve businesses. Our community support, I'm sorry, community support enabled us to uh, come up with matching funds. And in our third try, we got a USDOT Tiger Grant in 2015. The Tiger project consists of two phases. The first was to build a new industrial rail park along the existing rail on the northern edge of the city. That's the pink area on your map. This yellow was the rail that already existed. We had to build some additional infrastructure to create that rail park that was 44 acres. And then relocate the two existing businesses from downtown into that rail park. Um, they are under construction and will be moved in by Christmas this year. Currently we're in the second phase, which is where you see that green line coming through. Uh, we will be pulling, well first we'll be rail banking that property, acquiring it and rail banking it. Um, pulling up the tracks and building a uh, 1.6 miles of trail with a linear park and a complete street connection um, in place of that whole area where the railroad tracks are. The Tiger Grant itself was $10 million and at this point the city um, using tax increment finance or TIF dollars and our partners are investing another 30 million. Um, subsequent development currently being pursued on three sites in this core area will add another $50 million in investment. Over these last few slides, I, I'm just going to show you some renderings of, because we're at 30% on this trail design and um, intend to be in construction next year. So I just want to show you those, let you take a look at those renderings and talk about some of the key uh, lessons that we've learned. And the first is, I'd say, dream big. Um, dream big and do big. Create a vision. Show people in pictures what they, um, what they don't see right now. Um, show them what their words translate into in images so that they don't get stuck in what has always been. Um, and know that just because a project hasn't been done before doesn't mean it shouldn't be done or can't be done now because conditions change. So being aware of that is really important. There's always room on the bandwagon, I would say. Um, we worked hard to get every stakeholder involved and communicate with them early and often. We also brought in, um, as we worked on projects, we brought in actually as few consultants as possible. Um, we asked consultants to come in and do the things that we couldn't do ourselves, but the relationship building and the community development piece, we did ourselves. We've had been very fortunate with relatively little staff turnover, uh, and we really have developed stronger community relationships. That's been important. Um, so keeping everyone included all along the way has been key. This image is just showing you uh, from our downtown depot park, a view from Main Street. And then I, I want to point out too, as a, as a key finding your um, cheering, becoming a cheerleader for your partners uh, and celebrating every benchmark and success is really important. You know, I, I think I said earlier, we've been in this for 10 years now. We're not quite done yet. That's a long stretch. Um, so encouraging team members and, and project partners to sort of keep the faith. I mean, that's a one-on-one -on -one effort, but then acknowledging and celebrating all those little baby steps and, and as a way to gain and ma maintain community momentum for the long haul, that's been really important too. And so we're still doing lots of local media and events, um, try to recognize every little step along the way towards the fruition of this project. And whenever, yeah, whenever we have an event and we can have a party, we like to serve cake. But uh, we're trying to make it fun and include this community as much as possible. The image you see here is um, showing the trail that would be built um, right 
along what is on the right-hand side of your screen, our community historic Woodland Park. And on the left-hand side of your screen today is pretty much vacant land or very underutilized properties and imagining them differently. Oh, with a little homage here to some <laughs> uh, concrete, which is currently uh, often graffitied and we thought we'd leave it there and give a good place for that to continue to land. Another comment I'd make is that persistence pays. Um, you know, we've all heard it said, if it's easy, if it was easy, it would be done by now. Um, so it's important to be ready for that hard work and those really hard days. Um, the image you see right here is uh, important to us because in a community like ours, in a climate like ours, we know we're going to get snow. And what this image helps to communicate to our community is that city council has dedicated themselves to making sure that this trail will be open, not just uh, 24 hours a day with being well lit and safe, but also that snow removal will happen through those what feel like many winter months. So, um, you know, I think it's important to recognize that over three Tiger Grant rounds, we learned things we didn't know we didn't know, um, and the project just kept getting better. Um, at the point when we won that USDOT Tiger Grant, it, it really did feel like winning the lottery, and that's a really competitive dollar. So uh, we're pleased to be able to move forward with this project. And with that, I guess I'll, I'll look to close things up, but I'd like to do it with an invitation. Um, the core and rail project is on schedule. Uh, we'll be building the trail next fall. So I invite you to think about spending Thanksgiving 2020 in Kalispell, where you can find great restaurants and hotels in a beautiful historic downtown and walk off that turkey and pie on our new trail. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Catherine. That invitation is very compelling. I've been to Kalispell and it really is one of the most beautiful communities I've been to. So to get to see it after the Tiger Grant is complete and such a cool project uh, was very exciting. So thank you for your time on that. Um, I'm going to hand it over here to Krista Movel, who's the Assistant Director at Uptown Parking District in San Diego, to talk about a really cool uh, mechanism that they have going on there in their district. So Chris, it's all you. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Movel. Uh, I am the Associate Director for Uptown Community Parking District in San Diego. Um, I grew up in California, I attended the University of Hawaii, and then I was, came to this job from the state legislature for the state senate, and I've been here for about three years. So that's enough about me, let's get into the good details. Um, a community parking district is essentially a city advisory body that uses parking meter revenue as a resource to develop eligible projects and programs at a grassroots level. Um, we're managed by Economic Development Department uh, with a dedicated traffic engineer who works specifically with the parking districts around the city. And our budget is included in the um, Economic Development Department's yearly budget. So for Uptown itself, uh, to explain sort of the, the neighborhoods that we handle, um, San Diego is a very large city. It's about 372 square miles. And um, a lot of that is single family homes. So where we are at in San Diego is the urban core between downtown, north of downtown and south of Mission Valley. And that area comprises four specific neighborhoods. Uh, one is Bankers Hill, uh, which is directly west of Balboa Park. Uh, and that has a lot of mixed use, large scale development with a long narrow business core that extends about 16 blocks. Um, north of Bankers Hill is Hillcrest, uh, which is south of the eight and Mission Valley has much more of a focus on single family homes and um, is sort of the LGBT core in San Diego. So there's uh, a lot in, in that community that there's, there's a, a big attraction for that community. Um, International Restaurant Row is a business heavy uh, neighborhood, um, less residential near the airport in between the five freeway. And Mission Hills is a mixed use neighborhood similar to Hillcrest with a central business district that um, and, and residential surrounding. Um, Uptown became a community parking district because it is one of San Diego's more densely populated urban areas. Um, it's very parking impacted and uh, meter impacted as well. And so what we do is essentially after expenses, so all the meter revenue, all the meter money goes to the city treasurer's office where they come out and pay expenses for enforcement things like that, uh, the revenue that's left 
they send to the city, and we split that with economic development at a 55% to 45% split. Um, usually the city commits their percentage to match sort of our community developed projects, but that's not a guarantee. And yearly, our, our revenue is generally about 700K. That's generally what, what we get from the city is somewhere around that. Our CPD was actually defunct for a few years, and so we have a little bit of a different situation. The money accumulated for about, and to a little over than five million, and so we were able to sort of dedicate that to some large-scale CIP projects, like the two renderings I've shown. This is the Normal Street Promenade, which Normal Street is a, a street in Hillcrest that's known because it's where the large LGBT flag is. It's where the um, Pride Parade originates, things like that. It's also home to one of San Diego's uh, biggest farmers markets, and um, it's a street that the parking is very their meters are underutilized, so we're looking to develop a complete street working with the city and SANDAG to sort of uh, commit our funding to also developing this is like a multimodal zone. It would also help connect the bikeways that are planned for to connect downtown to the North Park neighborhood. Um, we are a nonprofit that's governed by a board of directors, and all the four communities are represented via neighborhood specific subcommittees. So instead of having our subcommittees focus on the work product like marketing and things like that, we do all of that work in the neighborhood level. And we do that because the neighborhood needs are very, very diverse. And, and uh, so we look to sort of break it down to that level and let things develop more communally. Uh, we do have a mixed board representation between the specific business and residents um, so that both businesses and residents have, have a voice because their needs are often very different. So for uh, Bankers Hill, which is that larger neighborhood, a big focus was on multimodal parking, uh, multimodal transportation methods, bikeways, pedestrian infrastructure. And a lot of that too is because Bankers Hill is adjacent to Balboa Park on its uh, eastern side. So there's a lot of uh, tourism traffic that could come from Balboa Park into that Bankers Hill core. Um, for Hillcrest, it's, more, it's adding more commercial parking. Um, it's, we rent a farmer's market in Hillcrest uh, for off hours, and that's what this billboard is here. And so you know, that's also adjacent to that Normal Street Promenade, and that's one of the ways we, we add parking in the Hillcrest neighborhood. We add parking in Bankers Hill more through um, changing the streetscape through like uh, parallel to angled parking conversion, things like that. IRR, the International Restaurant Road, the main project is a dedicated valet um, that, that parks a couple thousand cars every, every year. And with Mission Hills, it's mixed. We're doing a lot of red curb reduction and adding parking and, and things that way. Um, our funds are prioritized uh, and, and maximized by keeping our staff and expenses pretty low. 85% of our budget is dedicated to projects. 10% goes to contingency and 5% goes to operations. And that's fluid across the four neighborhoods. Each of the four neighborhoods develops their own budget so that their specific needs and projects that neighborhood wants are, are, represented, are, are presented to the board level at an appropriate time. Um, we've really been successful at building strong partnerships with city council, with um, economic development, and with other government planning organizations like uh, SANDAG, the San Diego Association of Governments. And one of the reasons why we've been able to invest in some of these large projects is we got on uh, the SANDAG permits for the bikeways. And so, you know, by being a nonprofit, we're able to sort of step outside of, of the ivory tower and connect a lot of these different bodies that might also not communicate specific for their specific plans for the neighborhood together. And so that's one of the strengths that we have. Um, we, after we do spend these, these uh, big CIP monies, our budget will go back down to about 700. And at that point, we're gonna be looking at doing a lot of sort of uh, meter management. We also do a lot of small like micro projects, sort of like these are uh, parking stencils that we, Notice and installed for um, the East Bird and, and Lime and, and Lyft e-scooters that sort of proliferated San Diego. And um, so I know that these scooter companies have added a uh, bonus of if you park in one of these stencils, you get a dollar bonus off your ride. And so, you know, there's there's little micro projects that we look in doing like that, parking conversions, pedestrian infrastructure, like uh, pedestrian safety infrastructure, blinkers, stuff like that. Um, all of our money have to be specifically dedicated for parking and transportation purposes. We are governed, 
very strictly by CPU by council policy. And um, so the the difficulties are sometimes we don't get to really set our own timelines on things. We have to be very patient and let things work out the way they will work out. And that our role in that is a lot of times to sort of connect what is going on in, in the government level with the community and to negotiate the needs of both, and sort of bridge that need. And um, with that, I will be happy to stick around and answer any questions and say thank you for listening to me. And hello from San Diego. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, just so everybody knows, Chris, Catherine, and Ryan will be staying on for whatever time we have for Q&A at the end. And if you aren't able to get your question answered in that time, please feel free to uh, write your questions in the question box or to Shaylee, myself, or Jackson, um, and we can make sure we connect you to, uh, to get some follow-up questions on that. So thanks, Chris. Uh, it's really, really cool work. I uh, really appreciate your time today on the webinar. Uh, I'm going to hand it now over to Ryan Sharp of the City of Hoboken. Thank you for your time too, Ryan. Love to hear what's going on in Hoboken. Thanks, Lindsay. I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Ryan Sharp. I'm the Director of Transportation and Parking for the City of Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get the controls here. So Hoboken is about a one square mile city um, located just across the Hudson River from New York City. Um, and uh, despite being one square mile, it has a population of 55,000 people, um, which makes it the fourth most densely populated city in the U.S. Um, and since 2000, actually, the population has grown by about 47 percent in Hoboken, uh, which is pretty, pretty crazy considering that um, it's already such a densely populated city um, and an old city that's been built out for a long time. So it's happened uh, mostly through redevelopment. Um, and Hoboken also happens to be the birthplace of Frank Sinatra and baseball and the cake boss. Um, so here are a few photos that kind of give a little bit of the uh, context of what Hoboken looks like. Um, it's a very urban community, as I mentioned before. Uh, we have a bike share program. Um, we have a complete streets policy and program that we implemented back in 2010 and has been um, uh, very successful in uh, helping us implement numerous complete streets projects across the city. Uh, we also have uh, some peer parks, um, as you see in the bottom right there, which have been used for, for major concerts. Um, and it's really a great setting for that because it, get this beautiful view overlooking the Hudson River and the uh, Manhattan skyline. Um, so in our one square mile city, we have uh, one street in particular that we consider to be our main street, and that's Washington Street. Um, it's approximately 16 blocks north to south, about 1.3 miles um, in length. And in a lot of ways, Hobo or Washington Street is already uh, a great street. Um, in, to, in 2011, uh, the American Planning Association actually designated Washington Street um, as one of uh, the great places in America under their Great Streets uh, Great Streets category. Um, and uh, part of the reason behind that is that Washington Street, as you can see here, has beautiful historic architecture. It has walkable, human-scale urban design. Uh, it has mixed-use zoning, and when you put all that together, you get a 24-7 kind of thriving uh, commercial and retail corridor um, that functions as the city's main street. So with that said, uh, a few years ago, um, we, we, ha we, we faced uh, a point where it had been 20 years since Hoboken or since Washington Street had uh, been repaved or really had much uh, in, in the way of TLC or maintenance um, since the last streetscape project that happened there. And um, despite being a destination and despite being a very popular uh, uh, main street in this region, we had to ask ourselves, how do you make a great street better? Um, and, you know, the best way to do that is really to go out to our community and figure out um, what the community thinks 
in that regard. And so we, we engaged in an extensive public outreach process that lasted nearly two years uh, between 2014 and 2015. And uh, the community came back and said, we don't want our street to look like this anymore. Um, those previous pictures I showed you didn't really show the street itself, um, but this is kind of what Hobo or what Washington Street had become within the curb to curb right of way, uh, largely because of uh, old infrastructure underground and utility companies constantly having to uh, cut into the asphalt and uh, get access to our old 100 plus year old water main system, to our uh, 150 year old sewer system. Uh, and, and other underground utilities. You, you factor that in with um, freeze-thaw cycles and just wear and tear from 20 years of, of traffic volumes. And uh, this, this is what we had. So we have a great street kind of on uh, either side of the street, but within the curb to curb right of way, definitely room for improvement. Um, so this slide shows uh, the, the, the amount of crashes that happened on Washington Street. Um, between 2010 and 2012, and as you can see in the bottom, uh, there were significantly more crashes than expected. Now that expected number is generated um, through through a software program that essentially looks at the traffic volumes and the width of the street and the number of pedestrians that are in the area, and it has an algorithm that assumes, um, you know, based off of a standard calculation, how many uh, expected crashes would there be under these conditions and Washington Street far exceeded what the expected crash rate uh, would be for this kind of a, a corridor. So after all that community outreach, uh, the community came back and said, we want to turn this into our ultimate complete street. We have complete streets all over Hoboken. We have uh, projects that people really like where there have been uh, curb extensions added or bike lanes. Um, or, or other kind of complete streets elements that have improved mobility <clears throat> and safety. But the community wanted uh, Washington Street to really be uh, kind of the culmination of all the different complete streets components um, that we've done uh, kind of piecemeal throughout the rest of the city. And for Hoboken, that goes beyond just uh, improving mobility and safety. Of course, that is really the, the foundation of a, of a complete street. Um, as it's typically defined. So uh, that meant adding bike lanes. It meant adding uh, high, vis high visibility crosswalks and curb extensions that dramatically reduced uh, the width of the pedestrian crossings. Um, it also involves uh, upgraded traffic signals. Uh, seems boring maybe, but the old traffic signals um, on, on Washington Street, some of them dated back to 1949 before they were, were replaced. And we actually have the oldest continuously uh, operating traffic signal in the country, um, which uh, you could tell when you saw it out there. It actually hung over only one side of the travel lane. Um, so for the southbound side of the street, uh, you would be driving and the traffic signal head would be on the opposite side of the road, um, which certainly contributed to some of our crashes. Uh, so uh, we also improved um, lighting along the corridor. We added back-end angle parking on about half the quarter uptown. It used to be front-end angle parking, but the back-end angle parking uh, makes it safer. You have better visibility, um, so you're not backing out into oncoming traffic or backing out into a bike lane. Also, the loading activity happens closer to the sidewalk or behind your door uh, and not um, with your back turned right up against traffic. Um, and also, new pedestrian signals and countdown timers were added. Uh, so there are significant uh, safety and mobility improvements here that are kind of within the scheme of what traditional complete streets components are. So going beyond that, uh, the community wanted to see uh, resilient, sustainable uh, infrastructure implemented as part of this uh, uh, Main Street project as well. And so what we did is we took some of our curb extensions, and these larger ones are uptown, um, where there is uh, reverse angle parking, um, so that's why they're so large. Uh, but basically, you get the, the, the multi-layered benefit of having uh, reduced pedestrian crossings through the curb extension, shortening the crossing distances. You also get the aesthetic improvement, which is also a form of placemaking, 
by having a landscaped curb extension. Uh, but then you also get a stormwater benefit. You get drainage improvements, which is really important for a community like Hoboken, which has a combined sewer system, um, which means uh, during, during rain events, uh, we often have a CSO event, which means our stormwater mixes with uh, sewage water and it bypasses our treatment facility and goes right into the Hudson River. Um, so we have a state mandate to reduce the number of CSO events. And uh, Hoboken also happens to be at sea level and is one of the most at-risk communities in the country when it comes to climate change and sea, sea level rise. Um, so it's important to incorporate these uh, types of stormwater improvements um, into all of our projects, but in particular, uh, a project like Washington Street, um, where uh, it sits ge geographically in just the right spot where we can capture stormwater before it goes downstream into a lower line area of the city. Mm. And then also placemaking, uh, going beyond just, whoops, sorry, double click there. There we go, sorry. Um, so as a project uh, was nearing completion, um, we also went out and, and did a street art project uh, this June. Um, and we did rainbow crosswalks. And uh, there are other streetscape projects that are um, part of phase two that will be implemented uh, in the future as funding becomes available. Uh, but the point is you don't have to stop with just a traditional uh, complete streets components, and once you've uh, paved or and, and, and restriped your road, you've added bike lanes or uh, bus stops or, or, or any mobility improvements, um, you can still go further and you can do things like asphalt art uh, to create placemaking and create a sense of, of community. And this was a community-driven effort. We had uh, a couple dozen volunteers come out and help stripe this crosswalk. Um, so that helps create... Um, a sense of community in terms of their investment uh, in Washington Street as a as the signature Main Street in Hoboken. And one of the last components I think is really important to talk about um, when converting your Main Street uh, or improving your Main Street is curbside management. Uh, you can design the best most beautiful looking main street you can ever think of with beautiful bike lanes, with uh, enhanced bus stops, um, with uh, curb extensions, you name it, all the amenities. But if you don't have uh, curbside management that accommodates at a minimum for commercial loading, then you're probably going to end up eventually um, with a broken system. Uh, there are more deliveries now um, than ever before, thanks to um, the proliferation of online retail um, and deliveries through uh, TNCs, et cetera. So um, you have to have a place for loading and deliveries to happen, especially on your main street. And um, we made it a, a point to have uh, at least two loading zones per block um, to accommodate loading activities in Washington street to reduce uh, the frequency of double parking um, and parking in bus stops. Uh, previously, we had a situation where um, you know a FedEx vehicle would park in a bus stop, and then the bus couldn't load, so they are, are pulling to the bus stop. So now they had to load and unload in an active travel lane, which creates traffic congestion. Um, and if you're a cyclist, you constantly had to ride around double parked vehicles. Um, so the whole system in that regard was broken. And we felt it was really important to have uh, loading zones and also managing uh, your on-street parking supply through um, paid parking and doing that in a way that generates turnover. And then, as Chris said, using some of that money um, through a parking benefit district ap approach to reinvest revenue back into the main street itself for additional improvements that could eventually go towards uh, streetscape enhancements, um, or, or other improvements that are going to go directly back into that community that is generating the parking revenue. And here are a few pictures of um, some drone footage of our rainbow crosswalk on First Street and Washington Street. 
You can also see the curb extensions there. Um, the new crosswalks, the enhanced bus stop is in red there on the bottom left of the screen. Um, and that's actually City Hall, that uh, historic building kind of front and center there on the left photo. Mm -hmm. So that's my presentation. Thank you again very much to everyone. Thank you, Ryan, and also thank you, Catherine and Christopher. This is Shaylee's voice, just by the way. Um, I want to thank you for sharing your community stories and providing some insight on how you navigated certain streetscape changes. Uh, once again, I'm here to tie it all together and remind us of our guiding philosophy, which is talking together. With the toolkit in this webinar series, we really wanted to draw attention to this value of talking together, of people supporting each other, and tools supporting each other. And we see this theme being addressed at many levels. Specifically, as it relates to this webinar, we want to emphasize that all of the nuts and bolts all of the streetscape elements and all of the strategies and policies do talk together. A, su a successful streetscape design might include smart parking features. A strategy for slowing down vehicle traffic might determine how you place certain streetscape elements. And a pedestrian network strategy might allow you to create and manage new types of traffic demand. The street is such a complex space of moving and stationary parts that it really helps see the whole picture of the street system and its transportation network, and to see how one strategy can support another, and how all strategies should support the unified vision you and your community arrive at together. And that's why talking together is also an overarching value. We do think that you should arrive at your strategies together with your communities by talking together. We can't guarantee any of the strategies presented today or in the toolkit will work for your unique communities and situations. So it's important to talk together with your partners and stakeholders to find the right fit and the right idea for adaptation. That way the strategies your communities test and implement follow along with a collective vision. We'll talk more about this idea in next week's webinar, which presents chapter three of the toolkit, Building a Better Street Together. But having a community collaborative process will help us implement People First Street and knowing about the nuts and bolts helps us navigate that collaborative process. The conversations support each other just as the toolkit pieces support each other. So for jumping, uh, if you're jumping into this webinar and not yet familiar, I just wanted to point out that these webinars have an associated handbook that provides further context and an associated uh, online resource library that provides further tools and resources. So before, as a last piece to wrap up before we dive into the Q&A, I just want to remind our viewers, new and returning, that we have modeled this webinar series after a classroom uh, master class experience where webinars uh, we have been weekly and we've been providing summary PDFs with brief assignments that provide that more immersive learning and peer learning experience. Uh, for this week's assignment, we are asking you to do simple sketch or mind map. Uh, in the connection mapping exercise, we hope you will draw connections between an impact area, as we presented last week, a streetscape element or strategy, as we've kind of talked about today, and a brainstorm of people you would need to reach out to and partner with to support this idea. For example, you, maybe you are interested in a vision of economic vitality for your main street and see that pedestrian wayfinding signage might be achieve that goal. So maybe in order to confirm that idea and make it happen, you would need to make connections with local public works department, the historical society, main street, cultural, civic, and recreation destination leaders, um, and maybe even a signage manufacturer. So we hope you enjoy this exercise of drawing out connections between the visions, the strategies, and the people you need to partner with. So look out for that follow-up email that we will be sending with the summary PDF as well as these assignment details and an additional example that you can look at of how you can map connections. Um, we'd love you to also share these maps of this, uh, on social media and we'll also present some in next week's webinar. So please submit. Uh, thank you, Nal, and I'm going to pass it over to Jackson to facilitate our question and answer time. Thanks, Shaley. With the remaining time, we have a few questions here and a few that I've curated for us to spur the conversation. Additionally, if you'd like, we have an additional mentee meter poll, and we ask 
how have you advocated for similar ideas in your community? So we presented three case studies today in addition to several others that we included. But we want to know what are the things going on in your community and perhaps how can we help you? So if you go to menti.com and use the numbers 164676, we'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, we have a few questions already logged that I'm going to pass around. So the first one for Ryan, several people asked a couple of parts. One, what are the lane widths affiliated with Washington Street? And I think what that goes to is the cost benefit of taking away some of the road space for cars. Did you consider moving loading zones to side alleys or other spaces? And what about bike lanes not being placed next to the curb and that potential conflict with cars and delivery trucks? So we'll start there and then we'll go for a few more. Ryan? Hi, uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, yeah. Three great questions. As far as lane widths, um, uh, the entire length of the corridor has an uh, 11 foot wide travel lanes. Um, Washington Street is uh, the, f so it has actually higher uh, bus volumes in terms of bus passenger volumes than um, car volumes each day. There's about 9,800 to 10,000 uh, vehicles per day that, that use Washington Street. We have over 15,000 bus riders that use Washington Street every day. Um, it's New Jersey Transit's third highest volume uh, bus route, the 126 bus, um, to the Port Authority bus terminal in Midtown Manhattan, uh, despite only serving about one mile or a mile and a half uh, of, of service. So that, that kind of tells you what kind of street Hoboken can be in that regard. Um, so we have high bus volumes. We have two-minute headways during peak periods, and NJ Transit um, would, would, would not let us go below 11 feet, which we thought was, was okay. Um, second question, loading on side streets. We looked into that, but our side streets in Hoboken are very, very narrow. They're about 25 to 26 feet curb to curb. Um, so basically, uh, commercial vehicles would get stuck if we put them on side streets. Um, they, they would not be able to make turning movements. Uh, we have very uh, small um, radii at corners as well. Um, so we had to put them in Washington Street kind of for those practical reasons. Um, and as far as the protected bike lanes go, the original plan actually had protected bike lanes on Washington Street. Um, and at the 11th hour, the city council uh, decided to vote for or vote, vote against the protected bike lanes, um, which uh, I was very disappointed on. Um, it had the support of NJ Transit because they preferred not to have the bike bus conflict at bus stops. Um, but, uh, you know, one, one, one challenge for any main street is, is, is how do you overcome generations of, of, of culture in your community. Um, and people in Hoboken have long been used to uh, being able to double park and uh, kind of play, play the ticket game. And um, we've made a lot of progress, but unfortunately we weren't, at least the city council was not ready to um, redesign a street that would not allow someone to double park uh, without kind of blocking the travel lane. And um, you know, again, it's really unfortunate for me, but I think someday uh, the ultimate goal is to try to um, uh, see if that would be possible. And actually, by putting in just a bike lane in general, there was no bike lane on Washington Street before. Uh, bike volumes have gone up by about 200% just by putting in the bike lane. And even though it's unprotected and even though cyclists often have to ride around double parked cars, uh, we also have a, a, a scooter share program in Hoboken. Um, and Washington Street has the highest ridership for scooter share uh, and probably the highest ridership for a bike share program as well. Um, so there still is value in terms of having the bike lane. It's a stepping stone possibly to something um, more robust in the future. Thanks, that's great. So for the last question today, I'm gonna to pitch it to Christopher and Catherine. We had an audience member ask us, do your projects ever face community resistance? I think that's a perfect segue from what you're talking about, Ryan, and then what that follow-up is, is what worked best to dispel that controversy? So Catherine, you first, and then Christopher. 
Uh, yeah, we, we do face community resistance occasionally. Um, actually, I think it circles back to communication and how important it is to keep folks in the loop. And uh, sometimes, for instance, right now we're at a 30% design on the trail and some of the routing may seem counterintuitive. Some pieces maybe don't really make a at first blush, maybe don't make sense to folks, but uh, once you have an opportunity to explain more about it and or hear more of their feedback, we we generally have been able to get past those hurdles. Um, not always. We have a property owner who, who has um, repeatedly voiced an interest in um, some dedication of resources that, that our grant just won't do, right? We just can't, can't, there are some things we just can't do. So um, there will be some moments when when we're not going to make everyone happy that's for sure uh, but i think by and large communication has been critical to helping us bridge misunderstandings which are often the source of um, any conflict wonderful what about you christopher um, i agree with her and also uh coming up our bikeway has featured a tremendous amount of controversy due to the amount of parking lots in the Hillcrest neighborhood, which they're going to lose about 25 spaces in their business core. So one of the ways we work to dispel that is because we're more on the ground, uh, up feet on the ground there, is to go around and find lots where we could possibly convert parking to add add more parking just by converting the street space. That's a pretty cheap way of doing it. Um, you know, we try to work with as many community stakeholders as we can, We, you know, but unfortunately not everyone is going to get what they want. You know, your neighbor may want something completely different than what you want, and we're trying to balance the interests of businesses as well as residents. So, you know, we try to have a mixed board to, to represent both those perspectives, but unfortunately, you know, sometimes you have to communicate that not everyone gets what you want, and uh, that's just the way of, of the game. Thank you so much. And as we wrap up today, just want to highlight again the assignment, so we'll share that out in the email either this afternoon or tomorrow, but as you saw today at the very beginning of the webinar, we're going to share some responses, so if you're so inclined, submit a photo, submit your responses, and potentially next week you might be the lucky person shared. As well, we have the AIA and AICP credits, so if you'd like to submit for those, we'd love to help you out with that. And with that, here is our contact information. and much gratitude to you staying with us for this hour and two minutes or so. Thank you. Take care, everyone.